All right, today we're talking about how to leverage the power of AI in business. We've got a certified expert in AI here talking with us. His name is Ab DeWeese. I'll tell you all about him in a second, so stay tuned. Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we feature top entrepreneurs, business leaders, and thought leaders, and ask them how they built key relationships to get where they are today. Now, let's get started with the show. All right, welcome everyone. John Corkin here. I'm the host of this show. And you know, every week I feel so privileged to be able to talk to interesting and smart CEOs, founders, entrepreneurs from all kinds of different companies. We've had Netflix and Kinko's, YPO, EO, Activation Blizzard, Lending Tree, uh, Grubhub, Redfin. Go check it out in the archives. Lots of great episodes for you there. And of course, this episode brought to you by Rise25, where we help B2B businesses to get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with Done For You podcasts and content marketing and our new podcast co pilot platform, which is incorporating elements of AI, which is what we're going to talk about here today. So it all comes full circle. And I'm really excited to have my friend Ab DeWeese here. And Ab is a polymath. He is got so many different skills and interests. And what's relevant for our conversation here today is that he's got a background in automation and now has been spending the last couple of years really studying AI and working with companies to implement AI into their company and help them to uh, really leverage that groundbreaking revolutionary technology but something really interesting about him is that he basically stepped out of his business at age 37 his, his business uh, good automation and um allowed him to work on other things for about five years or so before stepping back into it which we're going to get into in a second and of course i know ab through the entrepreneurs organization network which i'm a part of and i'm a big advocate for it's an amazing community but ab um i love to start people with talking about how they were as a kid, what they were like as a kid. And you grew up around your dad's manufacturing facility um, and they they created something really cool, like uh, furniture, I think it was, or um, it was something really interesting, wasn't it? Uh, uh, something <laughs> something that, that good in the world. What what did, what is it they manufactured again? Yeah, so he was a carpenter. They made, uh, they made the highest quality uh, oak toilet seats. Oak toilet seats, exclusively. Yeah. That's all they made. That's all they made. Yeah. That's wow. They just found their niche and they're like, this is us. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> when you're, when you get good at something, you double down. Right. So DeWeese Woodworking Company made oak toilet seats in the, in, in, uh, uh just outside of Philadelphia, Mississippi for you know, several decades. I joke about it because it's easy to, cause you know, it's something that people sit on when they take a dump, but, um, you know, it, I'm. You know, it probably was a great business. What did you learn being around your dad's facility? You know, with your dad, uh, it sounds like he owned the business or was the founder of the business. Yeah, he's a founder of the business. So, uh, I earned, man, I learned so many things. I learned uh, uh, he had two filing cabinets. Um, one was for customers, and one was vendors. And he told me he's like, he's like, son, knowing, knowing, uh, anytime I would break, meet somebody that's related to the business, like knowing which filing cabinet to put them in is uh, is really important, you know, because sometimes, sometimes they might be both, but you got to know which one they are. Um, uh, I learned pretty high tech at the time. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I learned what, a what, a the word vendor, the word purchase order, because he would hand write purchase orders on the sheet of paper and file them. It's just record keeping all this newfangled technology databases and AI, all it is, is it's, it's just automation for record keeping, right? You can do good record keeping by hand. It's just keeping records. There's nothing magical about the data being in a computer. It's just easier to retrieve. But, you know, keeping stuff by hand is, uh, it just helped me understand, like, kind of the essence of some of these things. The other, one of the, a couple other things I learned from him, uh, I learned, like, the art of manufacturing is to make things easy to do so that so that when new people hire on, they don't have to think hard about it and, and things are mistake proof and especially safety. You want to design things so that it's really hard to hurt yourself. He taught me about, you know, these saws and machinery. He had this one radial arm saw that's probably like 70 years old, this big cast iron thing. And he'd say, son, this thing does not have a mind. It doesn't have emotions. It doesn't have a soul. It will take your arm off and it won't even slow down. It won't feel bad about it at all. Like, uh, you have to really respect the danger of this machine. And so I grew up around a factory floor, just understanding, you know, safety, automation, flow, um, you know, kind of at a really young age, a lot of fun. And now there's some second generations that see their kids, they see their parents run a business and they see a lot of the 
the bad sides of it. They see the struggle, the ups and downs, stuff like that, and they run away. They say, like, I couldn't imagine that life for me. But it sounds like to you, you weren't put off by it. You obviously are an entrepreneur now. Um, do, you, do you feel like you were inspired by watching his experience, by being a part of that to ultimately become an entrepreneur yourself? Or was it just the, the natural path for you? Yeah. So thanks for the question. I was inspired not to go into business for myself. Um, and, <laughs> that does, and then that's the other path is yeah. a lot of people I've interviewed are like that. They're a second generation. They're like, I'm never going to go into business for myself. And then the first couple of years in a career, they do something else. And then they end up finding their way back towards it. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So I, uh, I remember just thinking like the stress of having other people work for me. And, and I just didn't want to take that on. I just, you know, I, I was always passionate about math and physics and technology and, and software. And, and uh, that's where my heart was. I knew I wanted to go to college. So I went and studied physics and I, I had no interest in starting a business. Um, and it wasn't until we were pregnant with our first child that I realized I just had this like huge urge to uh, go and earn um, that I just doubled down and, and uh, started on my long and arduous entrepreneurial journey. Uh, but no, I didn't, I, I, really didn't want to do it at all. Um, although I, I was inspired by my dad to sell and I, I didn't know it at the time, but he's, he can sell anything. He has a silver tongue and the ability to connect with people. And he's one of the most, he was one of the most empathetic people I've ever met. And so he never met a stranger. He could connect with anybody. He was deeply, deeply genuine. He cared about the people that he interacted with. And because of that, if, if he had a thing that he thought would benefit from them, all he had to do was talk about it. And um, I was lucky enough to be surrounded by that and, and was able to really, really deeply internalize that. And that's what makes me an unstoppable salesperson. Yeah. Um, you actually grew up in Mississippi, which is where your dad's uh, factory was. And it's funny, as you mentioned it, you know, you're interested in physics, you're interested in software. I can't imagine that there was a lot of people around you that shared those kind of similar interests. Did you feel a bit like a, a fish out of water? Did you struggle to find your tribe, your community when you were young? Yeah. I mean, in a couple of different ways on the math and physics side, I had, you know, I had some, some, uh, some friends interested in science in high school. That's the ones I gravitated to. Uh, but just for context, like I didn't even know what evolution was until I turned 19. Um, because they didn't teach it there. Wow. It's just wow. not in the curriculum. Wow. Uh, so a lot of kind of late stage exposure to, to, to science and stuff. Um, and then, the place where I really, you know, the really big transition for me to like fit into a community for the first time was when I joined EO in 2019. Mm. Uh, I know a lot of EOers, you, you may have had the same experience, John, is where, you know, I didn't realize how lonely I was until I joined EO. And I, I found myself surrounded by tons of like-minded people with kind of the same brand of crazy and uh, uh, just felt that community and connection. And it was, it was a pretty awesome uh, experience for me. And I, I just haven't let go since. So it's funny, you started your business um, around the same time. I st first became an entrepreneur as well. So my oldest was one years old, one year, one year old when I started my business, almost exactly his first birthday, um, which looking back on it now seems a little crazy um, at that point in time. Um, you said you had this, you know, ur urge to earn. Um, what was your vision for the company that you would start at that point in time? Yeah, so I didn't know I didn't know what I was doing at all. I knew that I wanted to start a business. I got that I got that urge. Uh, the company I was working for just announced that it was sold, and I was like, "Oh, well, that's how you make money. You build a business, right?" And um, uh, so I was the this this fancy new thing called the iPhone had recently released, and um, they had just announced that they were going to make it possible to develop custom applications for the iPhone. So I bought a Mac laptop, um, taught myself. I got uh, Xcode taught myself um, Objective-C, uh, learned how to program against something called UIKit, which they later they were later rebranded to iOS, and uh, was taking uh, wa follow watching uh, videos of these two guys giving guest lectures at Stanford on how to write off iPhone apps. Like taught myself I iOS development. I was going to write apps for the for this you know, this new revolution that I knew was coming. So yeah. I put all this time and effort into writing and learn how to write software. And then one day I was like where's all the money at? And, and I realized that it's because I didn't go talk to any customers or sell yeah. anything. And, and I realized that I had a hobby. Um, mm. What I thought was a company was a hobby. Uh, mm. And that was, uh, that was kind of my first, uh, my first strike at business. And I had did, a second. Did you, so did you turn around and start talking to customers and selling? 
Uh, no, I, I'm a slow learner, John. Sometimes it <laughs> takes me it takes me once or twice. So I, uh, I then I partnered with a couple guys, and we're going to make this company called CubeSheet, which would take two spreadsheets. And you take a sp- two spreadsheets, upload them to a server. It's going to automatically mash them together and automatically merge them. Um, so you can unify spreadsheets and it was going to have a learning algorithm and, uh, uh, and I, I, there I go again, like all software, 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 writing the code, making it work, engineering it, designing it, putting all this effort into product development. And when it's finally done, I'm like, where are all the customers? Yeah. Uh, so kind of a classic case of falling in love with your idea rather than going out to the market and seeing what people want to pay you for. Yeah. And, and also secrets don't, don't sell, right? Stealth mode doesn't sell if you're in stealth mode, because you're afraid to tell people about your idea. So if anybody's listening that wants to start a business, uh, the, the, uh, art of the start, uh, by Guy Kawasaki nails it. Um, Mm. tell everyone about your idea, Mm. every single person under the sun. And if you get lucky enough that someone takes your idea and competes with you, they just saved you years of agony building an idea that's easy to rip off just by knowing what it is, right? Mm-hmm. So if if it's so easy to compete with you just by telling someone what you're doing, then don't waste your time doing that venture. So tell everyone what you're doing um, and sell to them early so that you raise awareness and have a shot, you know, just like a tiny shot. Um, that would be that would be my feedback. Uh, that yeah. would be my my uh, my my offer to anyone listening that's a uh, that's a would be entrepreneur. Yeah, um, or so the I lean said, start. Uh, you know, the lean startup by Eric Reese is another book that I would recommend to people because that talks a lot about you know creating a building some kind of minimum viable product, not spending too much time on that, and then going out and trying to sell it in the marketplace, see if people are actually willing to part with their hard earned dough for it, and then knowing that you can continue on with that idea. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, that's an excellent recommendation. The crazy thing is I presented my business this morning to a group of men uh, just to get some feedback on how to uh, take it from, uh, to undertake this transition that I'm doing right now, uh, building, building SaaS products. And that exact book is recommended. So that, yeah, so yeah. twice in one day, you might have to read it. So, um, so then you end up founding good automation, right? So that was that, the, that was the third, uh, iteration yeah, so of the, the business. This, this cube sheet deal, I realized, okay. So the other lesson I learned is I thought that I was going to go out to California and some guys I'm way smarter than these VC types. They're just going to give me a whole bunch of money. I'm going to keep 90% of my company and I'm going to pay myself a salary and I'm going to be a billionaire, right? It's like this, this it's, it's. It's it's almost embarrassing to think of how distorted my view of the way that that world worked. And did uh, you did time. you un- ultimately come out like Sand Hill Road and no God no I no. didn't even okay. I just I just woke up one day really my wife was eight months pregnant and she walked up to me she said look you're either willing to quit your job for this or you're not um, I'll support you either way what what are you going to do and I was like oh wow when you put it like that no I'm not so I shut it down pretty much that night mm-hmm. um, so which, which was which was kind of difficult to go through that mourning period of, you know, realizing that I failed, you know, mm. it's, no, it's no fun to fail. I just yeah. got to get back up and go at it again. So yeah, in 2013, right before my second daughter's birthday, uh, first birthday, I, uh, I finished Think and Grow Rich. Read this book if you haven't. Napoleon Changed Hill. Um, finished that on an airplane and, uh, and laid definite plans to launch my business by July 1st of 2013. But because I made plans and I started putting pieces in place, I actually launched it in April of 2013. And I had one of my, and I launched it with a specific goal in mind that in a, in five years, I would replace, I, I would replace my salary as an engineer and retire. So I didn't have to work for money that the company would work for me. And I did it in four. And, mm. uh, yeah, really proud of that. And so what was the vision for the company? And how did you know that this third time around, people would be willing to pay you for it? Because I was like, well, let me do it the old fashioned way with a lot of like hard work, something that I'm really good at, where I've got a reputation and a kind of a personal brand. And I know I can do it. I understand the business um, because I had worked for a company that did exactly what my company does now. Okay. Um, so that, I, I love that piece of it. I always say to people, like, if you want to start a yoga studio, go work for a yoga studio. If you want to start a flower shop, go work for a flower shop. You know, for me, my first business was practicing law. I'd work for a law firm. Then I went out on my own. So it wasn't that big of a leap. So it sounds like you did something similar. 
I did. And I, just to be clear, the the business that I worked for was acquired and then shut down. And so, um, you know, there was to me, it was I had a very clean conscious. Ethically, it was very easy. And I would I would say to anybody else, if you if if you want to go launch your own thing, talk to your talk to the owner. Your owner is going to want to support. They'll be your biggest champion. Um, nothing yeah, sometimes they become a customer, right? The first customer, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Um, so I knew so I knew it was a business that I could do. And I knew like it's a body business that doesn't scale, but I knew that it would give me enough cash flow that I could get my time back. And so that's what I was solving for. I was solving for getting my time back so that I mm-hmm. could swing for the fences on bigger opportunities if my downside is covered. And that's what I've always I've always solved for that. It's like I want to protect my downside, have guaranteed income, and then get all my time back so I can do whatever I want. Yeah. So how did you escape the the common trap of starting a business where you're trading hours for dollars? And then you get caught in that. You get caught in client service, working with the clients. Clients want to work with you. How did you manage to get yourself out of it within four years? I guess a handful of things. One is uh, putting a plan in place and then just going after it just aggressively, maniacally, methodically. Um, uh, When you find yourself busy, raise your rates. I would always, if I was busy, I'd raise my rates, kind of try to keep my rates high, take risks and hire. Um, but also, you know, sometimes you got to like pour a little out for your dead homies, right? Pour a little out for the gods or leave money on the table. So I could, you know, if I looked at my net profit at the time in 2017, I could have kept taking home all I was taking home, or I could leave money on the table, hire, hire people to run it for me to do the job that I was doing and pay them, make less money, but not have to work. And the other ca- the other part of the calculus was I could stay in the business to keep grinding and growing and make it a bigger business. Or I could say, no, this is good enough. Like I like my lifestyle. This is enough for me. And I prioritize my time and my freedom. And so it's not necessarily easy, but but the hardest decision is like, how much do I need? What is it that I want? I'm the only one that can answer. What do I want? And and then realizing, OK, I've checked all these boxes. And sure, there's these other things that I want. but you know, at what cost, right? I have to work for, for a couple more years to hit that. Why don't I just, this is good enough. Let me take a step back. And, um, and it was, it was understanding where sufficiency was, uh, for me that, uh, that, that helped me hit that goal. I I don't fully understand probably all the nuances of what good automation did in the early years, but, um, it seems to me that one of the structural challenges with that business model um, is similar to what you have with AI now, which is ultimately you're advising and consulting with a client. And if you're successful, then they don't need you anymore. If you've automated everything, they don't need you anymore. If you put AI in place, they don't need you anymore. You're shaking your head. So I guess that's no, not what not, you were doing. Not even close. I mean, okay. that's what I was doing, but but that's, man, that's like short. One of my mentors calls it short-term thinking. It's like, Albert, that's short-term thinking, long-term thinking. Um, so that's a mindset of scarcity, a mindset of abundance says, uh, you're doing that. Let me automate that. And then you won't need me. And I'm going to work myself out of a job and you're going to be so happy that I did that. Plus when I'm in there, I'll find five other things that I can do to help you. And you're going to hire me to do those. And I'll work myself out of a job and I'll find more things to do. And you're going to hire me to do those because the, the there's a four letter word, right? Help H E L P. Um, if I'm finding ways to help you and you're my client, you're going to keep bringing me back in. And if I can find ways to move the needle for you, you're going to keep bringing me back in. And, uh, it's really that simple. And there's always, there's always ways to improve. There's always revenue to capture. There's always cost to cut. There's always cost to cut. Technology is always improving. There's new things to integrate. And so I just have a mindset of abundance and I've always just kind of always embraced that. And I've never, by having the philosophy of working myself out of a job, I've always had another one to work myself out of. Interesting. Did it take a while for you to develop that mindset? No, uh, Zig taught it to me in the car on the way to work uh, on, on the order of like 2011, 2012. Before Zig's- starting your business. Yeah. So, so was- Zig Ziglar, was- the yeah. motiv- what, you know, thought leader, motivational speaker, um, he listening to some of his tapes and CDs. Yeah. He just get yeah. right in my ear hole and say, you can do it, Ab. <laughs> Selling is selling is nothing more than the transference of feeling. Uh, You know, it's your duty. If you have something that will benefit someone else, um, it's actually shame on you if you don't tell them about it. Like just those kinds of things, that mindset Mm. of abundance. Mm. 
just, I just had that, you know, had that in my heart on the way it, in. An interesting observation about you is that you've got a very a science oriented mind. You've got an analytical mind, the physics mind, and then you also have the sales side to you. Oftentimes those two don't go together. Yeah, that's uh, it's kind of weird. <laughs> it was a good combination, right? To be able to yeah, no, I love it. I mean, so sell and you know handle the interpersonal dynamics of selling something, and also be able to understand and explain complex ideas. Yeah, I mean that's it's. I'm I'm very lucky to have both, right? Most engineers, they're 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 engineers and they want to talk to people, and it lets me straddle both worlds. And then because I can speak the technical, the engineers respect me, right? I'm not just like some like sales guy. They're yeah, like an anthem. Yeah. So um, you step out in 2017. What mm -hmm. was that like when you when you step back and you're running it for an hour a week? How you know what did you do with your time and how did you manage that transition? Because there are some people that they discover that then then they but their happiness plunges actually after getting out of their business. Yep, happened to me. So uh, the the whole idea like you have an exit and then you go through this personality crisis. I can tell it's not about like the, the win. I didn't have a big windfall. I just walked away from the company and, and, you know, I continue to own it. I just ran it for an hour a week, but, um, but I had this, you know, I had this, this, this period of depression uh, because my, I lost my identity, John. Like I, I walked away, you know, I went from being like the man, like I walked in the room, like it's my company. Like they, they, people report to me, they do what I say. They look to me for wisdom, for leadership, to, to answer questions um, you know, it's, it, there's, I didn't realize like that stuff props your ego up. Right. And you walk away from that and it's just, it was just a big, like, it was just a big, massive change. And, uh, and then also my community, my sense of personal connection, like I was in the office every day and, uh, really enjoyed the people that I interact with, really enjoyed the problems, really enjoyed you know, just like leaning in and then not having that, I had to find other ways to connect, other things to do, other ways to apply myself, other things to lean into. And um, and that I, I just assumed like, OK, cool. I retired at 37. So I won. Like, where's my happiness? You know, where's my happiness cookie? Like, where's and 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 it didn't show up. And I had to realize a lot of soul searching and realize like that wasn't the answer. The answer isn't stop working. Like the answer, the answer is the journey. Right. It's the it's the, the 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 destination is the journey. Like the reward is the journey. Right. Uh, and so that was that was fun is to is to is to discuss. I mean, the period of depression wasn't fun, but to grow through that and discover that and realize that no leaning in is what matters. Staying engaged is what matters. And uh, it's one of the things that contributed to probably one of the most fulfilling experiences of my adult life. Um, but let me which back was, up and, which and was the, was yeah okay go ahead tell the whole story so I'm gonna tease it a little bit and back up so um, I went to Eccentric which is the U.S. Central Region uh, re annual regional event uh, for it was, entrepreneurs yeah, organization yeah, yeah for EO and uh, I I joined EO in 2019 and uh, went to Eccentric either in 19 yeah I guess I would have gone in 2019 because I joined in January 19 I went in, in September ish. So a guy named Kevin Bonfield, EO Dallas, uh, really passionate about, you know, uh, le legacy by design. And that was the theme of the event. And, and we were challenged to, like, design the legacy that we will leave behind after we die. And, uh, and like, kind of confronted with that EO style, I worked through a few different exercises. And when I was there, I kind of had to face this, like, you know, OK, you get you, you get one shot at this thing called life. What what is the mark that you're going to leave? And so I, I knew that I, I always wanted to try to solve the unsolvable problem, the biggest, hardest problem in physics. I learned about it in high school and I was like, you know what, I'm going to do that. I'm going to solve that problem. And I just learned that general relativity and quantum mechanics don't work together. Like they just don't like they're both they're both super accurate and they both work, but they don't work together. And I didn't even know how I didn't even know why. I just knew that they didn't work and that the smartest people in the history of mankind couldn't solve the problem. And so I'm like, well, that's what I'm going to do. I said that to myself in high school because you're, you know, you're young and you're all full of ambition and you're like, I can do anything and conquer the world. And then and then you get like a job and you get married and you have kids and you kind of lose some of that spark and fire. Uh, well, so in eccentric, you know, they start asking that question, like, what are you going to leave behind? I was like, this is what I want to leave behind. And uh, 
And I just got really excited about it, wrote it down. And it's like, I'm going to actually learn this. So I bought a, uh, I bought a book, uh, I bought a book to learn the math, to learn general relativity. And I couldn't even read the second page, I couldn't <laughs> read the second page of this thing, uh, and started, uh, talking to a friend of mine who is a physics professor at UTA, a local university in the Dallas area. Um, and, uh, I was like, I would like to talk to somebody that knows general relativity so I can, you know, I can, he can teach me where to go learn the math. And, uh, and so, uh, and so one thing led to another and I'm in, uh, before I know it, and it's COVID times 2020 and, uh, I'm in, I'm taking math methods and theoretical physics. And then I enroll in a, uh, 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 PhD, de a degree program, start doing all the coursework and I'm taking uh, general relativity, taking quantum mechanics, I'm taking all these things and I'm having the time of my life learning this stuff, uh, in, uh, 2020 through, uh, 2022. Uh, so the most, one of the most fulfilling experiences of my adult life, and I don't mean like one-offs, like when your kids are born, like, I mean, like prolonged experience uh, was getting to take general relativity and cosmology and having it broken down, spoon fed to me so I can learn a little bit every day and be able to form a full mental model of how that stuff works and kind of peek behind that curtain. And it's, uh, it's, it's just, it was such an awesome time. I had been out of college for about six years and in the workforce before I went back to law school. Um, and I think there's something you said for spending some time in the workforce and then going back to school and you kind of appreciate it on uh, another level, um, when you've been out working for a while <clears throat> and then you suddenly get the gift of being in a classroom, such an amazing privilege to sit there and learn every day. It is. And I do you remember being in undergrad and having to write a paper? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I remember I was, I was an English major, so I did a lot of them. <laughs> oh, well, you did a lot of them. So, but yeah. I remember like I would procrastinate for weeks to write like a page and a half paper. And and now I'll have to rip out a 10 page proposal just to get a deal done, you know, or write yeah. a one page email. And it's nothing. But it's, you know, it was such a huge deal when I was younger. Yeah. And so I feel like you just come back to things with a certain perspective. Uh, yeah. Kind of the workforce. Yeah, for sure. Um, so you end up um, kind of to to um, I know we're, um, my my eyes on the clock. So I know we have another 15 minutes or so before we wrap up. But um, you you end up kind of stepping back into your business and your vision for the business is to evolve it for the coming revolution in AI. And you this is how many, many one of the many ways I know you is that you really dove head first into AI, what lit a spark under you that made you so passionate about this? I mean, it's like, uh, it almost seems like a platitude, but chat GPT. So I, so when uh, that came out, it was the same thing yeah. for me. Yeah. It just, I mean, I always thought of AI as like this little ivory tower experiment. It's kind of cute. It works in the lab. There's no commercial purpose. It's not like it takes way too much money to pay smart people to do something that's ultimately impractical and not really fieldable. And it's just, it's, it's a waste. Like this is not something commercializable. So I just completely disregarded it for the longest time. And when ChatGPT came out and I could talk to it and it passed the Turing test, or at least passed my Turing test, um, which is the Turing test is a, is a, is a, uh, uh, your, your listeners can Google it. It's just a famous thought Classic experiment. test again. for what, what, yeah. what becomes a uh, true thought, I think with a computer, what, what well, it's can Canon Canon. So a guy named Alan Turing designed this fictitious thought experiment and says, if you, if you take a, if you write a message on a slip of paper, stick it in a slot in a wall um, and it, it, something grabs it. And then another piece of paper comes back with a response and you can't tell the difference between whether it was written by a computer or a human that's called the Turing test. Mm. And so I write a chunk of text. I send it to chat GPT and like some little gnomes in the background are typing and send me something back because it it passes the Turing test, right? A, a computer gives me the answer, but it looks like it was written by a human. Mm. Um, that's called the Turing test. So anyway, so it passes it. And I see this happen and I'm like, okay, the world's about to change because everybody's going to see this. And this is going to fundamentally change the user interface of all software across all humanity. And it's probably going to happen in less than a decade. And I was like, You've heard Bezos, I don't know if you've heard that Bezos said, you know, I wanted to stake my claim uh, in the internet. And so he built a bookstore. Um, got in the car, drove across country to Seattle. Yeah, built a bookstore. Right? Started with the bookstore, yeah. 
So uh, I wanted to stake my claim in this AI era, right? And I've got this company that's got brilliant, absolutely brilliant electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, physicists, aerospace engineers that are that that are amazing software developers. So they all know software. They all have deep engineering, mathematical disciplines. Very good at this stuff. I've got this army of people that are good at this, and we're doing test and measurement applications for large multinational manufacturers. I'm like. My team under will understand this stuff. I just need to go out into the wild, learn it, bring it back to them and speak it to them in engineering language as opposed to AI voodoo language. So I did that across 2023 is just leaned in and taught myself the, the I knew all the concepts. I just didn't know the vocabulary. So go and learn the vocabulary, understand how the math works under the hood. It's all matrix multiplies, probabilities and um, and just large scale computing and a little bit of dynamic feedback, some stochastic gradient descent, which turns out is just a PID loop in, in, in new clothing. Um, and a bunch what, was, of what, was the, what was what was the company's reaction when you said, when you stepped back in said, hey guys, I'm back. <laughs> and um, we have a new North Star and it's called AI. What, what was the reaction like from your company? Yeah, I mean, like uh, like optimism, but also a little bit of like hesitation. And, and uh, who are you? <laughs> trepidation. They're, they're, yeah. they're like, there's a running joke. It's like, you know, Apple, Apple, I, I do a, I do a project one time and Apple go and tell the customer I'm an expert. And they're like, I'm not an expert. I've only done it once. I'm like, all those other engineers have done it zero times, right? Mm -hmm. You've actually done this project before. That doesn't make you an expert. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I have this like unabashed confidence that we can do things. And I don't write checks I can't cash, right? But the, yeah. um, my team was... They're, they're always a little nervous and work, but my job is to just push them forward um, into things that I know that they can do. Um, and they may not necessarily, you know, they may not know it yet, but I get them in those situations and they they always perform because they're brilliant. Um, so it's just kind of like a little bit of that. And and then, you know, converting it, you know, from, you know, anytime you come, anytime the leader comes back in, there's always a little bit of like, you know, some upheaval and some change. And yeah. Uh, but we just managed through it and and like we're hitting on all cylinders. And of course, you'd learn your lesson, hopefully, uh, from the previous companies of of not trying to sell something that the customer didn't want, the market didn't want. So what was it like when you started going out to the market and saying to the market, maybe the current customer base, customer base for for good automation or new customers and said, hey, we've got this AI consulting package or however you sold it. What was that like? It's really interesting because the first thing they do is they just they just dismiss you. Like, yeah, so does every other person on the street that's an AI expert overnight. Um, and so that's sort of the biggest challenge is overcoming that and actually demonstrating that, yeah, we actually do what we're talking about. And, and these are the things and we can, you know, we can we can dis we can build a model from scratch and, and see and, uh, and and train it or we can grab things off the shelf and integrate it together. And, and the hardest part is to solve the, you know, look at the business problem, break that down and solve it. Um, so those were those are really the challenges, uh, not that the market, the market not needing it. And then on the product development side, um, as we're developing SaaS products, uh, you know, I guess I needed to learn that lesson a third time because some of the, you know, getting the feedback, like from you, like the Lean Canvas and, and today, uh, some of the feedback I got earlier this morning is like, look, man, go and spend a little more effort validating the market and a little less effort developing the product so you're developing the right one. Um, so, but but John, as you know, entrepreneurship, you don't, you don't just like learn it all and then go make a bunch of money. You're learning every step of the way. Like right. when I'm not learning, I'm dead. And um, yeah. when I'm not making mistakes, I'm dead. And um, and so I'm just, you know, continuing yeah. to to move forward as fast as I can. How do you um decide? So it sounds like the company has a has done for you services for clients, and then you're also developing products, apps, which mm -hmm. maybe have a longer cycle for getting revenue or getting to profitability. How do you decide how much energy and effort to put into those two different strategies? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and uh, the for me, back to sufficiency. Like when I started my first business, when I started my first real business, I wanted to know what was the minimum I had to put on the table, and then and I would bring that revenue in. I'd spend the rest of my time building my business to scale, and then eventually uh, it was able to scale, but only because I laid the foundation. So here it's very similar. I've got this services business that cash flows. And I've got profit and excess cash flow, and I just take every single dollar and I put it into hiring additional engineering capacity to accelerate product development. So the answer is as much as I possibly can. That's and are there are there some that you can share that you're working on right now or that you've launched? 
Yeah. So I've got three that'd be kind of fun to talk about. So uh, one is a, it's a medical, uh, medical note product called Scribbler where a uh, doctor talks into a phone and a uh, full medical note comes out. And uh, this is not something I could do by myself. My partner's an ER physician and uh, having watched him on a shift and the cognitive load that he carries from room to room to room as he's seeing emergent cases and that he's got to then go back and like brain dump all this into a computer. He spends easily 50% of his time in front of a computer dictating at lightning speed as he does in the room with the patients. And so to be able to speed up that workflow allows him to see more patients. Um, that's when we're really excited about. Uh, we've got, uh, we've looked at all the big boys that are bringing uh, similar kind of products like this to market. And every one of them is making the same mistake. It's wonderful. Um, so we're feeling really good about this. And uh, this product is, uh, the prototype is ready and we're, we're, we're in talks with the hospital and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get a, we'll get our first pilot in the next few months. Um, we've got another one that's a platform for complex sales, uh, which is, it's more of a horizontal kind of play where we can build different verticals on it. The first vertical is in the automotive market. And uh, that one will be ready for a pilot at a large dealership um, at the end of the summer. And if that's successful, we can fan that out across the country. So I'm uh, really, really excited about that guy. And what it does is it's, it's an AI system that takes a complex sales process and, and shortens the time to close because it gathers a lot of information from the prospect and helps you form a sales proposal without having to meet twice or spend a lot of time gathering information. Um, and then the third one is a collaborative chat tool that's uh, it's essentially GPT for, for teams to be able to work on conversations at the same time, pull people in and out. It's like Slack. It's like chat GPT and Slack had a baby. And uh, that's uh, that's one that the prototype will be ready in a week. And uh, we should be beta testing that pretty soon. So keep your very on cool. the EO WhatsApp channel. Keep your yeah. eye out. There'll be a link for that guy. in the Yeah. Video. Yeah. Very cool. Um, I wanted to ask you about. Last summer, you discovered that you had ADD, which is an interesting discovery to have uh, later in life. Um, my uh, my son has ADHD, um, and so I'm familiar with it. But what has that impact been on you personally coming to that uh, revelation? It's like it's like it's like taking off this backpack full of rocks and just setting it on the ground and walking away from it. This has been amazing. Uh, I have it in spades. I've lived with it my entire life. And I always just thought there was something wrong with me. And uh, I also was dismissive of this ADD thing because it was, I thought it was a three letter acronym that was used for, for doctors and psychiatrists that were lazy and didn't want to diagnose an underlying condition. And, uh, and I started to study it for one of my children. I went, dug deep into it this summer to understand uh, my child so I could be a better father and just to like, you know, connect better. And, and pretty soon I realized like, I'm reading about me. I'm, I'm, I'm reading about my lived experience. Yeah. And then it hit me. I was like, I got ADD. And so this wonderful thing happened for me. I uh, called one of my uh, engineers uh, who's got ADD and he's like, Oh yeah, man, check out this, this website, like watch this girl's videos. So I go and I watch her video and then, and then she's got a Ted talk. I watch her Ted talk. She's like, and I hired this ADD coach and he changed my life. His name's Brett Thornhill. And so then I like look him up, you know, send him a cold email and, and like on his webpage, my name's Brett Thornhill. I'm an ADD coach. When I was 43 years old, I learned I have ADHD and now I'm, now I'm an ADD coach and I'm like, well, I'm 43. So there's hope. Mm -hmm. And um, so hiring, you know, hiring him and working through that, it's, it's just been, this amazing experience of understanding my brain, understanding how my mind works, not fighting against me and who I am, but embracing who I am. And I have stopped expecting myself to do things that I'm not good at. Like I don't leave. I don't take action items. I don't I don't take homework outside of meetings because I'll have the best of intentions of doing it because I want to help. And I'll leave it and I'll just put it on the list and it won't get done. So mm. I don't do it. And mm. everyone's happier. I'm happier. Everyone that I interact with is happier. Um, and I embrace my ability to sort of 
to go deep into different things sporadically throughout the day. And then I surround myself with people who are more linear thinkers that can focus and get things done. And it's just been the, the most freeing experience to appreciate this about myself and not beat myself up when I do something like walk through a doorway and forget where I'm going. Uh, because then I laugh about it and remember a few seconds later, right? And it's all good. <laughs> uh, this is great. Thanks for sharing that, Ab. Um, uh, yeah, I'd love to uh, wrap this up with my gratitude question. So I'm a big fan of expressing gratitude, especially to those who've helped you along the way. You've mentioned a few names here, uh, Brett Thornhill, Kevin Bonfield. Um, anyone in particular you want to just acknowledge and thank them for um, helping you in your journey? Yeah, uh, my professor, uh, Dr. Musilek. Uh, when I reached out to him uh, in uh, 2020 to ask about uh, how gravitation worked, he said, ah, you need to take my math methods of theoretical physics class to learn, you know, learn tensor analysis, like this special kind of math. Um, you could just join, just, you don't know, just join my calls. Like just join the calls. Like you can sit in on them. I'm like, awesome. So I sit in on them and then he encourages me to take the next one and then introduces me to another professor who's like, why don't, why are you auditing all these classes? Like, why don't you just apply? I was like, I can't apply. Like school starts in a week. Like it takes a year. He said, no, 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 just, just apply. We'll get you in. Right. And, and um, so Dr. Muse, like, just like literally just like pulls me in to the university, um, uh, invites me to his group. It's just this wonderful, amazing human patiently teaches me. I take one of it. I end up taking one of his classes every semester and um, and because of him, I had one of the most fulfilling experiences of my adult life, which culminated in learning, you know, how the Big Bang worked and the formation of the universe. And so for him, I'll be eternally grateful. That's great. Um, this has been uh, really interesting. Where can people go to connect with you or learn more about you? Uh, you I'm probably I'm terrible at social media. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me on the EO database uh, or you can just hit me up at abdeweese at gmail.com. Excellent. Ab. Thanks so much for your time. All right. See you, John. Thanks for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.